Hey everyone, my name is Nick Becker. I'm also a member of the NVIDIA Rapids engineering team. And I've been working, or we've been working with um, Rollin, with Lori, with um, the rest of the folks at NERSC um, for the better part of the last year, as Rollin mentioned. And I'm really excited to sort of take on uh, where, you, take up where Ayush just left off and talk about Rapids. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen. Please do yell in the chat if you can't see this. Um, if Rollin or Lori, you can ping me if that happens. Okay. Um, are you all able to, able to hear me well? I'll take that as I'll take that as a yes. Um, so Rapids, the platform. So my colleague Ayush just mentioned in one of the slides that GPU computing traditionally was about taking the compute intensive portion of your application or your workflow or workload porting that to GPUs. And the way that has been done traditionally is to either write CUDA code, um, which looks a lot like C++ or C code, but has additional um, aspects of it in order to program and use the APIs to hit the GPU, or use things like compiler directives through things like OpenACC, which perhaps some of you have actually used successfully in the past or use existing libraries or applications that have been already GPU accelerated. And that's worked really well, um, but it's also made GPUs hard to use from higher level languages that are really productive, as Roland mentioned, like Python um, and in other areas as well. But it's also meant that there's a significant effort involved in writing that code uh, for the same reason that the Python data analytics ecosystem is, is really powerful you don't want to write Fortran code, perhaps, or write C code to do your matrix operations, to do your, your, your sort of numerical calculations, if you can write Python code that wraps that underlying Fortran or C code primitives, but doesn't add that much overhead. The Rapids Initiative is an open source project that NVIDIA is incubating to bring GPU computing and GPU acceleration to the expressive productive languages like Python, just like you were using the existing expressive, flexible Python libraries for doing analytical computing, as well as for doing things um, in massively parallel for, um, form. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means and some of the benefits and you know, how we go about doing this. So for those of you who are familiar with the Python data ecosystem. In a second, you'll see a slide that looks a lot like this and see it very familiar. But so Rapids is really an end-to-end -end accelerated data science ecosystem. Instead of taking the 5% of your code that's compute intensive, let's take 99% of your code. Because it turns out even the areas that aren't quite as compute intensive can still be exposed to significant parallelism. And so if we move data preparation onto the GPU, we can move model training onto the GPU, we can move visualization onto the GPU, and we can then put the entire feedback loop on the GPU so that you can do science faster and test more hypotheses and iterate more quickly. And Rapids has a suite of libraries to allow you to do this. For data frame oriented analytics, we have libraries that we call CUDF, the CUDA data frame. There's IO libraries for doing you know, ingestion, file IO. There's machine learning libraries, graph analytics libraries. There's support baked into the deep learning libraries. There's visualization. All of these libraries sit on top of the GPU. And they use the Apache Arrow memory specification on the GPU. And we scale them to multiple GPUs using Dask and soon with Spark as well. And so the reason this is particularly important is something that you know, hopefully um, some of you had a chance to see in the notebooks, but if you haven't, that's okay. We'll go over them and we'll see in, in even more clarity later this afternoon while we accelerate a real NERSC workflow. But the reason this is important is that data processing has evolved several times in the last decade. And each time we've gotten better and faster and it's allowed us to do more work, to do larger work and to ask new questions. Um, so, you know, about 10 years ago, the common 
process for doing large scale computing was MapReduce. Um, many of you probably wrote MapReduce jobs um, where you would read data from something like you know, an HDFS system or some kind of distributed file system, do your work, then that, work, that would finish, and then you'd write out to the file system, and then you do your next phase, but that would read more data back in and then write it out, read more data back in, perhaps you would do something after that. And you know, this was great because it was a really efficient way of doing it compared to the existing alternative, which was very minimal. But Hadoop had its drawbacks, or in particular MapReduce with HDFS had its drawbacks. And Spark came along about you know, you know, several years later with the idea saying, why don't we try to keep all the data in memory at once? Let's read once, maintain this in-memory data structure for all of our work, and then write at the end when we need to finish our results. And that was a big deal. That gave us a significant improvement, you know, 25 to 100x faster, um, less code, which is very important as well and not to be underrated. But it was also language flexible. So you see things like PySpark and obviously Spark is, you know, in the JVM world, so there's Scala Spark and there's, you know, incredible productivity that we can gain by not having to write MapReduce jobs. And, you know, traditional GPU processing gives you even more benefits beyond Spark but it's a little bit language rigid. You, know, you can't traditionally use GPUs in languages like Python. Um, it takes a lot more code to write CUDA than it does to write PySpark, for example. And so we started having some of the same issues where we could get the speed, but we suffered on flexibility. And even when we got the speed, we would lose it sometimes because you would put part of your application on the GPU, but to do that, you might need to copy data from one data structure to another on the CPU, before sending it to the GPU, which is another copy. Then you could read the data on the GPU, do your application, send the results back, and then you have to bring it back to the CPU, perhaps. And these data movement, data transformations, and copies negated some of the benefit. If you keep the data entirely on the GPU, there's no need to do any of these things. If the GPU data structures are consistent in memory, if there's a standard format that everything can interoperate with, we can avoid these problems in the first place. So what we've done is that we've learned from the Apache Arrow project. You know, for, for those who are less aware of this project, the world on the left side of the screen is the world in which people use different tools for doing different types of work, and the tools don't communicate with one another. And in, in order to combine these tools in a workload or a research um, pipeline, you have to copy and convert data between formats all the time. And often, in fact, in some studies, more than 75% of the compute time is wasted on just serializing and deserializing data. Apache Arrow was something that was incubated probably about three or four years ago and tried to say, why don't we solve this problem by agreeing on a memory format? Let's define a specification for cross-system communication and allow tools to share this format. That way we don't have to have any of that serialization and deserialization sign. We can communicate between tools in the same way. We've learned from this and have implemented a subset of the Apache Arrow memory specification on the GPU for Rapids. What that means is we can now go one step further. We can get the same code that we're already running to be 50, 100 times faster in the flexible languages and keep the data on the GPU. So that's Rapids. Rapids is about faster speed for all types of science questions, all types of analytics questions, without having to go down and take the hits of flexibility and data movement and all that stuff. And so this is an example workload of doing a lot of data processing and data prep with a machine learning model and comparing this workload with Rapids on the GPU to Spark. It's about 200 gigabytes of data, including transforming variables, doing binary operations, merging data together. And you can see on the left that doing the IO and data frame processing um, takes in this workflow about 2,700 seconds with Spark on 20 CPUs, excuse me, 20 CPU nodes. Um, it takes about 379 seconds with 100 CPU nodes. That's, that's a very large Spark cluster. With a DGX2, which has 16 GPUs, or five DGX1s that has each one having eight GPUs, we can take this down to just seconds. The same thing applies to the machine learning 
part of the workflow. The same thing, of course, then by construction applies end to end, where we can get workflows that were taking hours or minutes previously with, with Spark to take seconds or minutes with Rapids. And what's particularly exciting is that, like the other ecosystem tools, they're improving over time. Um, Rapids is currently in version 0 0.13. Between 0 0.2 and 0 0.10, the same workflow got 10% faster. And end-to-end, -end, it actually got even more faster. Excuse me, even, even faster, sometimes upwards of 40% faster. And that's because of the improvements we are making every day to this ecosystem and to these libraries. And so the reason this is particularly valuable is that when doing science or doing data analytics, Iteration is critical and speed of compute is crucial, but ease of use and the ability to test hypotheses can't be separated from that. Um, some of you may be familiar with something called Kaggle, which is an online data science and machine learning competition website. Without fail, the winners of these contests were the ones who could experiment more. More iterations was the key. Rapids allows you to iterate faster than ever before and to ask more questions. And that's what leads to better results and faster results. So I mentioned that in a few minutes, you were going to see a slide that looked like the first slide. This is the Python data ecosystem. Um, as Roland mentioned, you know, there are more than a thousand Python users, uh, Python users um, at NERSC. The Python data ecosystem is fantastic. Um, for, there's libraries like Pandas for analytics, Scikit-learn for machine learning, there's graph analytics, visualizations with matplotlib and plotly, scaled with Dask or Spark. It's an amazing ecosystem and it's amazing because the tools interoperate well and the APIs are familiar, they're flexible, and they're easy to use. Rapids fits that same API. It is designed to be a drop-in replacement for your existing PI data workflows. And so we scale that with Dask, which my, our, our colleague Vibu will talk about a little bit later um, as we go through the Dask workshop and the Dask notebooks. But at a very quick level, for those of you who are not familiar with Dask, Dask is how we scale Python native compute. It is a distributed scheduler for orchestrating independent but coordinated work in Python. And so what that really means in, you know, in layman's terms is Dask lets you scale your existing Python code from your laptop to your supercomputer. It's easy to install. It has the same APIs as the existing tools like Pandas, NumPy, Scikit-learn, et cetera. And it's built by the same people. It's the most common parallelism framework today for the Python data analytics com community for those reasons. And you know, Dask is great and Python is great, but Python communication is a little slow. And so when you scale Dask, it can be difficult to communicate across machines. UCX is the unified communication X protocol, and it's the underpinning of things like MPI, which I suspect many of you are, are quite familiar with. It's the underpinning of that message passing interface that allows uniform access to accelerated forms of transportation and networking, things like InfiniBand, NVLink, and others. Our colleagues and our team have brought this into the Dask world to provide Dask with the same kind of benefits that you could get with MPI. And the result is that you get incredible bandwidth with Dask now, um, with generic TCP, bandwidth for a sort of generic random data merge, which is pretty common, might be peaking at about 800 megabytes per second. With UCX and Dask, we can get sometimes even up to 17 or 18 gigabytes per second of bandwidth when we're using Rapids. And that's, that's what makes these workflows fly. And so I'm going to sort of take the next 15 to 20 minutes to go into two of the libraries that are probably very relevant for a lot of your workflows. These are the QDF and QML libraries for providing data frame processing and statistical modeling. So QDF is GPU accelerated data processing and feature engineering. Um, many of you probably have lived this, um, but in general, the average data analytics researcher or professional spends 
90% plus of their time doing data processing as opposed to training models or you know, actually analyzing the results of their data. It's spent doing the processing. And a lot of that time is spent waiting. With a GPU powered workflow, the time spent waiting goes away. We can rapidly iterate and we can still test our, our same hypothesis, uh, test the same hypotheses, but we can also test more of them in a single day. And so this technology stack is multi-layered. At the bottom, we have CUDA. This is all built on NVIDIA CUDA and the CUDA libraries like Thrust and Jitify and Cub, which many, some of you perhaps have, have written and used in your code. On top of that, we've built a library, CUDF C++, that we call our CUDF library, that provides a consistent set of APIs for data frame processing in C++. Now we've wrapped that into Cython and Python to expose these CUDA libraries and this CUDA, these CUDA C++ data structures natively to Python. So you can interact with it just like you would with Pandas and you can scale it just like you would with Dask. And so the backbone I mentioned is that CUDA C++ library that we call libqdf. Um, it's essentially a, a combination of, of table and column data structures and algorithms for operating on them. There are various CUDA kernels for doing common operations like sorting, doing reductions, element-wise operations, merging data, grouping, all sorts of different things. And we have optimized GPU implementations for different data types and data structures, things like strings. There, this is, there's a fully featured and fully GPU accelerated strings library um, for your text processing or any kind of textual data, as well as timestamps and numerics and all sorts of things. And you know, the primitives are, are pretty, pretty consistent and pretty clean. You know, a gather primitive will take in a table view and it will take in a column view and a gather map. And the gather map will be, excuse me, the gather map will be a, a, you know, a, view, of the, a view of a column and it's gonna just do the gather as if you were writing the CUDA kernel, but you can do this in C++. Now in Panda, excuse me, in Python, you don't really worry about C++ you, or Cython. You just use Pandas. The CUDF Python library has the same API as the Pandas Python library. It's a library for manipulating GPU data frames. You can do all sorts of things, including create your own functions, which some of you have already started the notebooks, probably have already seen, but we'll go through after this. Um, it's fully featured and it is as close as possible, just a thin layer on top of that, that sort of CUDA C++ layer. And because of that, it gets a pretty significant speed up. And so this is a benchmark of doing a variety of operations, things like taking group buys and doing aggregations on, the sum, on sums and, and mins and counts of different keys in different groups or doing merges. You can see that for 10 million rows or for 100 million rows, you know, we, we can get significant speed ups in the multi hundred times faster sorts and merges and group buys than using pandas with the same API, which is incredibly powerful. But it's not the whole story. Um, it's really, really about the entire ecosystem. So we put into CUDF a fully featured strings library for doing things like string splitting, regular expression engines, typecasting, concatenation, and even more high level things like doing tokenization and all sorts of things like that. This is now baked into the CUDF library. And you can see on the right, you know, the examples on a, you know, a, small, a small number of strings, significantly faster in the order of 10 to 50 to 100 times faster than using pandas. And in order to make this work though, you have to get data onto the GPU. And so we have GPU accelerated IO um, baked in for things like common data formats like CSV, Parquet, Orc, JSON, Avro, et cetera. Um, you know, these, are, these are baked in. And you know, this is one small example on the right but you know, 10 plus times faster than the equivalent CPU based. And the key is that we can put GPU acceleration both into the parsing of the data and in the decompression. And so a lot of you probably um, are doing work around not just data frames, but using arrays and sometimes even multi-dimensional arrays. And so Rapids is not just about data frames and machine learning and deep learning. 
it's about an ecosystem of tools and enabling this GPU ecosystem of interoperable tools that can communicate together. And so if you remember to that slide from about five to 10 minutes ago with that arrow world, where all the tools can talk to the central format, that should look a lot like this slide. And so array-based workflows that are using KuPy can use this. MPI-based workflows that you don't want to switch to can use this. To use Numba, you can use this. Deep learning workflows can use this. TensorFlow actually will be on this lit when the new version of TensorFlow now supports this. It's just the slide's a little out of date. Uh, TensorFlow 2.2. And so this interoperability is crucial, which it lets us do things like take Dask and NumPy, put that on the GPU to scale array workflows to multi tens and hundred terabyte size problems in climate science, in large scale biomedical imaging, and other HPC problems. You can take this world and put it on the GPU, and that's what we're doing here. And as an example of the, a multi-dimensional array slicing workflow, um, you can get significant speed ups, and, and not even just on the you know, terabyte sized data. This is on eight and 800 megabyte sized arrays. You know, these element-wise slicing or FFTs or stencil operations or matrix multiplications, these can be 10, 50, 100 times faster on the GPU with the same APIs. And as one example, um, we took a large matrix decomposition problem and scaled it across machines. And you can see that in this graph, the compute time is going from 600 seconds with Dask scaling with 80 CPU cores down to 30 seconds with Dask GPU arrays with KuPy and multiple GPUs. And so we actually did this at even larger scale. We did this at petabyte scale to see how we could do. Uh, we wanted to push the limits. And so the petabyte scale analytics took less than an hour of wall time to do significant matrix decomposition and processing on multi petabyte size workflows. And, and that's the power here. And so that power means you can do array based work and you can also do machine learning based work, things like clustering, um, you know, linear regressions, logistical regressions, all sorts of things. And so QML is the library for this. More models, more problems. You can test more hypotheses. And so the reason this is really important is that you know, data sizes are growing. So the same reason we needed to accelerate pre-processing and, and data handling is why we have to accel accelerate model training and model prediction. Because as the data size grows, the time you have to spend waiting for that to finish increases and that hurts research. So what you end up doing is reducing the features or reducing dimensionality with matrix decomposition or sampling. And you know, that can be great statistically for some problems, but you know, maybe you're working in an underpowered environment and you don't have the statistical power to sample efficiently if you have an imbalanced problem or all sorts of different things that make it difficult. Using the whole universe of data is just superior. And so QML allows you to do that with the same kind of technology stack that puts a C++ library on top of CUDA and a Cython and Python library on top of that that looks just like scikit-learn and scales just like Dask and scikit-learn. It uses CUPy, which is the equivalent of NumPy, uses the CUDA data frame. And it gives you all sorts of things, you know, different types of clustering, visualizations like UMAP and TSNI, spectral embedding, principal components, all sorts of, you know, um, eigenvector decomposition and stuff like that, you can do on the GPU and it can be significantly faster. Um, but most importantly, it matches the existing APIs. And that's a theme with Rapids. You know, that's why we're so excited about this partnership with NERSC and the, the fact that 25% you know, of, of users are using Python. This is just going to just work for those, those users. And, and hopefully you can you know, give this a try in your research workloads. Um, but as an example, you know, if you wanted to do clustering with scikit-learn, this, this is what you might do. You could use dbscan, which is you know, a density-based clustering algorithm. You could create some data and you could fit the model and call predict and you could do your clustering. And you'd get these nice little clusters. Um, in this case, there's two of them. Well, with Rapids, it's the same thing. Um, you just change your imports and it just works, except faster. And that's the power here. 
And so in this case, you know, we have some benchmarks that I encourage you to go look at if you're interested. I'm not going to go through them all here. But in general, for a lot of these, you know, machine learning workflows and matrix decompositions and things like that, you know, we can get significant speed ups for large data, um, you know, between 5, 10, 50, 100 times faster for a lot of different operations. And, you know, for those of you who are using things like Random Forest and XGBoost, those are supported in Rapids as well, as well as accelerated prediction, not just training, because prediction is important too. Um, again, I'm not going to belabor the benchmarks. I think the point's been made. Rapids is fast. And so it's fast with XGBoost, it's fast with Random Forest, it's fast across the board. And, you know, right now we're at version 0 0.13. This is from March um, of this year. And we have a lot of support, which is great. Rapids 1.0, perhaps later this year, will have full multi-node, multi-GPU support for most algorithms. Um, the ones that won't have that are, are largely ones that are more commonly done with smaller data, things like you know, autoregressive um, modeling like ARIMA and others. And that's, you know, that's really exciting. But today, even today, though, we have an incredible amount of support for large-scale problems. And I'm not going to focus on it, but there is another library for doing graph analytics. Um, this is a, a fully featured library as well that is fully accelerated and it provides breakthrough performance um, on large graphs and small graphs, all with a familiar Python API for those who, who use graph analytics. And it supports graphs with multiple GPUs into the billions of edges. Um, you know, I'm not going to go through all the algorithms here. You can look them up online. But there's a support for a lot of different types of things, including you know, Jacquard set similarity, overlaps, you know, K-Trust, triangle counting, page rank, the vein, um, all sorts of community detection algorithms and things like that. And it's fast. Um, this is an example of the high bench benchmark suite performance of PageRank. Um, this is a benchmark suite for doing you know, graph problems on graphs of various sizes across different algorithms. And the PageRank portion is one of the most canonically important ones. Um, and they have different designations around each data size between huge and big data and big data times eight. Um, you can see that for graphs with 400 million vertices and 16 billion edges, that's a 300 gigabyte size CSV file, on a single DGX2 with 16 GPUs, that took 30 seconds. With Apache Spark and 100 nodes, that took 96 minutes. That's the power of Rapids. And Reno Rapids is a community project. It is full of ecosystem partners with support from open source you know, maintainers across different libraries, support from people at various companies, support from people at various research institutions. It's open source, it's community driven, and anyone can get involved. And people are building on top of it. Um, you know, for, for those who maybe write SQL code, you know, there is a SQL engine built on top of Rapids. For streaming work, there's a streaming engine built on top of Rapids. And you know, that's, that's the power. This is about enabling GPU-based analytics. Um, it's easy to install. Um, those of you who've tried the notebooks have seen that, in this case, there's already been a kernel set up for you. You can just use the Rapids kernel. Um, but if you were to try this yourself in the, in the future, it's installable via Conda. You can download a Docker container if you were so inclined. You can use all of this in a nice, easy, interactive installation guide on the Rapid site, uh, which is linked or will be linked in the, doc in the documentation for this workshop. And you know, if you're interested in exploring this, you can contribute back. You know, we support the Kupai project, which is run by Chainer. Um, NVIDIA supports that both um, you know, with development time and with resources and with work. Um, you know, it's part of the ecosystem. It's a core part of this world. And you know, it's incredibly important to us. So we, we encourage you to contribute, to file issues, make feature requests, um, you know, improve the ecosystem so that we can best serve you, the scientists and NERSC researchers who are doing the work that we desperately you know, need right now as a, as a country and as a world. And so to get started, you know, in, in this workshop, you can use the, GP, the GPU notebooks that have been provided and use that Rapids kernel. But if you want to learn more, check out the docs. You know, there's a 10-minute guide to getting started. There's a whole set of docs that you know, we can go through, and there are links to them in the, in the workshop notebooks. And check it out on GitHub. Um, you can get us in the cloud on Docker Hub. If you want a Docker container, you can install it from Anaconda. You can get it from GitHub and build from source. Any way works. And so with that, I hope you've gotten 
a sense of what Rapids is. It's this ecosystem of libraries to meet you in the Python world where we can be most productive. You know, I have spent the last five years writing Python and Scala code primarily, both in the Spark world and in the Python world. And bringing GPUs into this world is a game changer. And it, it takes work that might take hours on the CPU into seconds sometimes. And we'll actually see an example of that later today with a, with a real workflow to, that went from out, that can go from hours to seconds. Um, so I hope you've um, enjoyed this you know, brief, you know, 30 to 40 minute overview of Rapids. And with that, uh, before we jump into the, the first notebook, I'd love to just take, you know, take, take a couple minutes to hear from a few questions, if there are any. Does anyone feel like they would like more clarity on some of the things we've just chatted about? Uh, hey, Nick, uh, great talk. Uh, there are some questions in the chat, so uh, you can look at them or I can read them to you, whatever is easiest. Um, do you want to read them? Thanks yeah, for yeah, that. Sure. Okay, so the first question uh, from Alex is, can GPU Direct be used uh, for I.O. instead of going through the CPU? So I think the question is, does the GPU do the, the I.O. itself? Great question. Um, the answer is that it depends. So GPU Direct RDM, or so Remote Direct Memory Access and GPU Direct Storage is something that NVIDIA is working on actively. Um, it's not in the current release of 0 0.13, but it's something under active development and it can be done. So that, that's planned for the future? That's correct. Okay. All right. Um, I have a next question from Dimitro. Uh, so he says on slide nine, um, so maybe go to slide nine. Okay, great. Yeah, so he says the benchmark is reading 200 gigabytes of data. He says previously, uh, you mentioned that you keep all of that data in memory. Is that true? Where do you have 200 gigabytes of RAM? Uh, is the memory on GPU so vast? Great question. So the answer is that we spread it out. Um, so GPUs generally, at least I believe the, the core GPUs have 16 gigabytes of, of memory per GPU. Um, the DGX, okay, great. So the DGX twos have GPUs with 32 gigabytes of memory. So for example, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but in this you know, example at the top and the left side, this purple bar that says DGX two, that machine has 16 GPUs, each with 32 gigabytes of memory. So there's across the GPUs about just under 500 gigabytes of memory total. These GPUs down here in the DGX ones, five DGX ones is 40 GPUs. And you can do the same math problem um, for whether it's 16 or 32 gigabytes um, per GPU. And there's enough memory in order to sort of have all of it in memory at once. Now with that said, Dask allows you to spill and you can spill both to CPU memory or main memory from the GPU or to disk if that's something that's important, if that's even more important, if you have to go beyond CPU memory, you can spill to disk. And we'll see a brief example of that or you may have already seen it in the Dask notebook if you've taken a look. Um, but we can talk about that more when we get to the DAS section, if that doesn't uh, fully answer the question. Uh, okay, so in this case, uh, are there, where does the memory sharing take place and uh, how does unified memory change this? Great, so yeah, that's a good question. So this is not using UVM. Uh, you can use UVM. Um, and then of course, you know, you have that shared address space, but let's just for now imagine we're not using UVM and we have perhaps 500 gigabytes of memory spread across 16 GPUs. This data set will be loaded in to memory in a distributed fashion. GPU zero might get some of the data. GPU 12 might get some other part of the data. The operations that happen after that are going to leverage data locality when possible. And if they don't have the data they need, they're going to have to request that data from one of the other GPUs you know, that's gonna be a transfer. And in some operations, they might, have, they might have to do a shuffle if they have to shuffle fully. The way that's orchestrated is with the parallelism framework. In this case, we use Dask. Some of you might be familiar with it. You may have also used Spark. Distributed memory is managed and orchestrated by that framework, in this case, Dask. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, that was my question. Okay, oh, so um, Alex just has a, a follow-up and wants to know, do you know when the direct IO will be released? I mean, you said in the future, but is that like in the next month or the next year? 
Um, I'd have to get back to you on that. Um, you know, we're actively developing it and we've, we, we have a blog post about it um, that we've released probably a couple months back, um, but I have to get back to you on the specifics. Okay, that's fine. Okay, this question is from Ryan um, and he says, it looks like uh, currently Rapid supports Ubuntu and CentOS. Are there plans to support uh, local installs on Mac or Windows? Great question. Um, so right now, we do currently officially only support Ubuntu and CentOS. Uh, we don't support Mac or Windows. Um, it's not something that is likely in the short-term roadmap, but I'd love to hear more about that and learn um, about you know, why that's um, important to you and we can and discuss that. We would like to support everything. Okay. Uh, next question is from Min. Um, Min says, can Rapids be installed on OLCF Summit using Conda and fully use the GPU resources? So I am not sure. Um, I am not well versed in, in Summit, just personally. Um, I suspect the answer is probably, um, but I think we'd have to chat afterward. Um, perhaps there's someone, one of my colleagues or someone at NERSC or at LB, excuse me, or at like Oak Ridge or somewhere else that has done this. I can add to that, Nick. Um, this is Zara. So we, we are working with Oak Ridge too. Um, I think the latest version of Rapids that they had was 0.11 in a, one of their modules. Um, I think it's the Ivy and Watson module, but that's a power system. So we've been working on the updating it to the latest release as of last week. I think they should have access to that. So they're going to update that to point 13 soon. Great. Thanks, Zara. Yeah, thank you, Zara. Um, okay, so the next question is from Jan. Uh, Jan says, can QDF read HDF5? Um, QDF does not have a baked in HDF5 reader right now. Um, that's in the roadmap, but it's not currently in the, the 0 0.13 release. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so we have about five minutes left in this session. Um, anybody has any more questions, uh, go ahead and add to the chat. Um, the slide, Nick's slides that he just gave are posted on our uh, website. So if you go to NERSC uh, Rapids Hackathon, you'll see uh, his slides and also uh, the slides from the first talk today.